Um, now it's my, my great pleasure to once again introduce Alexandra Lawrence, who I think is well known to many of you. Alex uh, is a graduate, uh, indeed a master's graduate from the West Coast of USA uh, in medieval Italian literature. She's been living in Florence for a long time, 20 odd years, uh, where she teaches and does highly bespoke um, guiding to people who really want to see things properly. Um, and she's a great expert on Dante, and as a lot of you have been enjoying her, her sessions on Dante this year. Um, but as part of the backstory to Dante, she's going to now this evening tell us about the um, medieval politics and the great strife between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. Over you to Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Simon, and thank you everyone for coming tonight uh, to speak about uh, and hopefully learn a little something new and, and converse afterwards about these two great political parties, the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. Uh, I always find myself, whenever I am talking about Dante and the comedy in particular and some of these references, I always find myself kind of very hurriedly explaining the Guelphs and the Ghibellines and the Blacks and the Whites and always saying, oh, it would be so lovely to have a little bit more time to actually go into this. Um, my graduate work, as Simon mentioned, is in Italian literature and language, but my undergraduate work is in political science. It was American political science, so it had absolutely nothing to do with the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, but I often joke that politics are my first love. So for me, this, this is fun, uh, getting able, you know, being able to get back to some of these texts and get back to some of these stories, really. Um, as Simon mentioned, I teach and I guide. And one of the classes actually that I taught for the British Institute uh, with the wonderful in the wonderful history of art department was always a kind of trecento walk. We called it a Guelph Ghibelline walk. So what I would give to be able to walk, you know, be walking the streets of Florence with all of you right now, pointing out all of these wonderful places. Alas, not possible yet, hopefully soon. Uh, but the wonderful thing about Zoom is that it gives us the opportunity to put everything on PowerPoint and to be able to maybe even touch on things that we wouldn't absolutely have time for or be able to talk about on the streets of Florence. So uh, without further ado, we will get started and uh, get into our Guelph Ghibellines and Blacks and Whites. So how does this all begin? I'm gonna, of course, start with Dante. I promise that I'm not gonna beat you to death here. I only have a couple of little uh, citazioni. I, in fact, I think this is the only one uh, from the comedy. But I, I do kind of wanna start and end with Dante. I find that he provides a really nice anchor for a lot of these discussions. So how it begins, how it, meaning how does this guelph Ghibelline conflict begin? So I'll just read you. This is Paradiso 16. We are in the heavens. Uh, we are actually in the heaven of, in the sphere of Mars with Dante as he's speaking with one of his relatives. He's actually speaking with his great-great-grandfather called Caccia Guida. And uh, uh, Caccia Guida says the, the following, O oh, Buondelmonte, this name, O oh, Buondelmonte, through another's counsel, you fled your wedding pledge and brought such evil. Many would now rejoice who still lament. If when you first approached the city, God had given you unto the river Emma. But Florence in her final peace was fated to offer up unto that mutilated stone guardian upon her bridge, a victim. Now these are, these are two tercets and then two lines from another tercet. This pretty much has the entire story of Buondelmonte de Buondelmonti enclosed within it. What does, what is Cacciaguida? So his great, great grandfather, what is Dante's great, great grandfather telling us here? He's recounting a story that happened, a, 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 an incident, let's say, a, a series of incidents that happened in the year 12, 16, in the year 1216. So uh, we, it starts out, oh, Buondelmonte, so speaking directly to 
uh, this particular Florentine uh, uh, elite, member of the elite, this patrician man, through another's counsel, you fled your wedding pledge and brought such evil. Through another counsel, Bondamonte was at a, um, you have to imagine it was a knighting ceremony in Campi, uh, now we call it Campi Bizencio because of the, the, the small river of the Bizencio that used to run through. Campi, you might know it as Peretola and that sort of area of the airport, but they, this was the countryside and they were out uh, in the year 1215, they were out at a knighting ceremony and Bondamonte, maybe he had too much wine water combination and he injured someone from the Adimari family so another patrician family and in order to heal that wound in order to make things right again the elders kind of sat down Bondelmonte is a young man a young patrician they sit down and they decide Bondelmonte is going to marry a woman from a, a young girl woman from the Adimari family and this will make everything right. Well, in the meantime, Bondamonte receives a visit. So through another's counsel, as you see here from Dante, through another's counsel, he receives a visit from a woman from the Donati family. Believe me, we're going to get into them in just one second. She comes and she sort of meets with Bondamonte all by himself, which is not really done. This is a, a period in Florentine history and, and really in European history, but certainly we're talking, we're doing this kind of micro drill down on Florence tonight. Um, this is a time period where it's all about the group. It's all about that um, identifying yourself, but also um, uh, acting with the approval of and in concert with a number of other people that you are allied with and your, your family and, and the, the relative families. So for Bondamonte to receive someone from the Donati family uh, that would uh, then influence him, it's told, of course, it's always a woman's fault, right? This woman comes to him and says, Bondamonte, you can't, you can't really accept this marriage. I can't believe that you would actually do that, right? It's, it's, it's taking away all your power and you're stronger than that. And so he unilaterally decides, this is part of the issue here with Bondamonte. So through another's counsel, he's influenced to not go through with the wedding, to not go through with the marriage. So this ritual of, of healing this wound, of righting a wrong through marriage, through the contract of marriage is broken by Bondamonte. And he decides that in fact, he's going to marry this woman from the Donati family. You cannot do this. You cannot unilaterally make those kinds of decisions. He goes and he's very pompous and he you know, sort of tells everyone that this is the decision that, that he's made. At that stage, the Adimari family, his family, everybody, you know, they're meeting on one side, the Adimari and, the, and their, uh, their uh, consulteria, their, their kind of partners are all meeting together. And they decide that the only way that Bondamonte, that, that this wound can actually really be healed, this kind of double wound now that we have, is for him to be killed. And so on Easter morning of 1216, and this is the scene that you see here painted much, much later, you know, the romantics loved these kinds of stories. We don't, of course, have any evidence of this, pictorial evidence of this from the time, uh, from the 13th century. Um, Juan del Monte is uh, viciously killed while he's riding on Easter morning from his tower house. I know those of you who, if you're here at the British, uh, listening to this talk, then you, uh, you love and adore the British Institute and you probably love and adore Florence and have been here many times uh, or live here part of the year. You have walked by the Bondamonti Tower a million times. This is uh, on uh, Via delle Terme here in right in the center of town. And uh, he leaves from his tower on his horse, uh, family tower, and goes towards the Ponte Vecchio. So I'm just going to go back to this image here, because what I want to show you is that um, this statue here, and Dante actually references it, right? He says, um, but Florence in her final piece was fated to offer up 
uh, unto that mutilated stone guardian upon her bridge, a victim, the statue of Mars, of the god Mars. We never, ever, ever need to forget that the Florentines have this kind of mythical founding ruler that is the god Mars. Right? There's that legend that talks about how the baptistry of Florence, the most Florentine of all buildings, was actually built over a temple to the god Mars. It's completely untrue. It doesn't matter that it's completely untrue. What matters is that Florentines feel this connection and they feel that they feel kind of like these warriors. They feel like they are this really bellicose kind of uh, popolo people that um, were, were created out of these veterans of uh, Julius Caesar's army in the first century BCE when the city of Fiorenza was actually founded. And so, um, this bodes well for our talk tonight in the sense that it's important to remember, it's gonna be kind of a bloody talk. Uh, it's important to remember that, that this notion of, again, whether or not it's true, it doesn't matter. The legend is that the god Mars kind of rules over Florence. Um, so Bondelmonti de Bondelmonti's killing is essentially the beginning. If you read anything, I remember even you know, all of the Florentine history that I've studied, it's kind of like the World War I when Franz Ferdinand, Archduke Franz Ferdinand gets shot, uh, gets killed, right? Um, that that's the beginning of World War I. That's the, 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 the kind of powder keg moment. That is for the Guelphs and Ghibellines happens in 1216. Now the reality is that these names of Guelph Ghibelline aren't actually used until a couple of decades later, but we'll get there. So where are we getting all this information? I mentioned that uh, we don't have any pictorial evidence. In fact, this is the very first image of Florence. Can you see here? This is the Madonna della Misericordia from 1342. This is Bernardo Daddi or school of Bernardo Daddi here at the Bigallo here in Florence. And it's the very first image of the city of Florence that we have, 1342. So you can see there a detail that I've pulled out. Um, this is the city of Florence that lies at the feet of the Madonna della Misericordia. And that's our very first image, pictorial image but we have lots and lots of information. Thankfully, we have these kind of portraits in words of the very periods that we're talking about tonight. So the 13th and early 14th centuries. The two big names, Giovanni Villani writing in the early 1300s, the Cronache, you can see here, I put this kind of very fun modern uh, book cover that I found uh, online here, and then a little bit more traditional. Dino Compagni, but these are still being published constantly. So um, Dino Compagni, who was writing a chronicle, this was a form of writing that was starting to become very popular during this time. I mentioned this um, uh, tradition of thinking about the god Mars and thinking about the foundations of Florence. This is the very moment that the city of Florence is being born. It's being created, the Repubblica, the Republic of Florence. The, the uh, history has yet to be written. And so you start to have, it won't be until the 15th century that or really late uh, 14th century that we actually have the, the signoria, the government hiring historians and writers to come in and write the histories of Florence. For now in the early 14th, and um, late 13th century, we actually have people who are doing it just kind of on their own and they're putting down, uh, thankfully for us, these uh, still extant sources um, with lots and lots of numbers and lots and lots of stories that we still use today. We take especially Villani with a bit of a grain of salt. Uh, he's kind of like Giorgio Vasari in that respect. So we always kind of knock off a couple of hundred or thousand from a lot of his estimates, but these are invaluable resources. So that really is where, where we draw from essentially when we're talking about Florentine politics in uh, the, this uh, medieval period. So we have Giovanni Villani and we have Dino Compagni and his, uh, his cronaca. And of course we have Dante, okay? Um, there is absolutely no doubt, and those of you who have read the Commedia know this uh, better than anyone, Dante is a man of his time. He is fully and completely immersed in the socio-political economic situation of his time. He's born in 1265. He dies in 1321. He is an active participant, as we're going to see tonight. Um, and he records 
a lot of his ideas and thoughts and thought process uh, of, of what is actually happening, his kind of philosoph philosophical outlook, uh, but also the outlook of a man who lives in Florence during a time that it is undergoing an extraordinary transformation. The um, kind of collage that you see on the right hand side of your screen, these are just some of the Dante plaques that that uh, are you know, kind of peppered all over Florence. They're sprinkled all over Florence up on buildings. There's one, uh, two actually on the Ponte Vecchio, for example. And it's, it's a beautiful project that was done in the, the early 20th century. So essentially they went through and they called all of the references, mostly place and family names. Uh, and they've, they've uh, extracted those lines from the Divine Comedy. So you can kind of have you know, a bit of a uh, Florentine Dante tour walk uh, through these wonderful plaques. So that's, that's a lot of fun, but it also gives us an extraordinary amount of information as we're going to see tonight. So it's not just Villani and Compagni, it's also Dante's poetry as well uh, that gives us so much uh, of, of an insight. So how about these names, right? And how about these uh, origins? Now, I do realize that some of you probably thought coming tonight, oh, finally, I'm going to understand exactly who was a Guelph and exactly who was a Ghibelline and why it was like that and who belonged to whom and, and the reasons behind it. And I'm really sorry to tell you that there's just not a whole lot of certainty when it comes to these sorts of things. So you might come away with more questions, we'll see. Um, but certainly, you know, historians have come to some agreement, not about the names and where they come from. This is what we know. We know that by the 1240s, we start re hearing referred to in uh, various documents, the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. Okay, so i Guelfi e Ghibellini, right? These names, originate in Florence. They originate in Florence. And there is, there are, the, the kind of consensus is that perhaps they come from very much extra Florentine uh, sources in the sense that if we're thinking about the empire at this time, there were kind of two families, the Welf family and then the uh, Hohenstaufens, who were vying for control of the Holy Roman Empire. And so there is some idea, even though it's not 100% by any means, that Guelph could be a kind of uh, adaptation of this kind of Germanic word Welf, and then uh, Weib Weiblingen, which would have been the castle that belonged to the Hohenstaufen family. So let's say that maybe they were these kind of two factions uh, of uh, two families and their factions um, on a much larger kind of international scale that somehow made their way into Florentine parlance and, and we get these names Guelfi and Ghibellini. This is the best answer that we have for it. And this is the one that you'll kind of find most often, but, but most historians will kind of say, okay, yes, we know that that's the typical explanation, but the reality is we have no real hard evidence of this. This is a kind of best, best guess scenario. Um, I put the uh, stemme, I put the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the stemme, the um, coats of arms, the emblems of these. You see them all over town, especially the white ground with the red giglio. So this is a kind of lily or iris, however you want to think about it. Um, which still to this day, the, the Guelph symbol is still to this day, the symbol of Florence. So that's what you see flying on Palazzo Vecchio. You know, you have the European Union flag, the Italian flag, and then the Florentine flag, which is the Giglio, red Giglio against the white ground. This is because as we're going to see the Guelphs were ultimately victorious and uh, the Ghibelline stemma, uh, emblem has fallen out of use, although you do see it on the facade of Palazzo Vecchio, and that's just a red ground with the white Giglio on it. So this is why uh, we have uh, uh, the the uh, flag, let's say the 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 emblem that we still do um, here in Florence today. So we'll start off with the Ghibellines, right? Um, uh, oftentimes, the kind of short answer about the Ghibellines, and I'm talking about in Florence, so I'm really going to keep this focused 
on Florence tonight. Um, and, and really because this is, uh, again, where it was born, where it was created. And especially again, because of Dante, this is uh, such an important part of, of our history here in the city. The Ghibellines typically, when we give the short answer, we say they're the Imperial Party, meaning that they tended towards a the Imperial sphere of influence. Now, what does that mean exactly? Um, the, uh, the, the, another, let, let's say not easy definition is who is noble? And in fact, you're not going to hear me using this word. You're going to hear me use a word elite. And we'll talk about them in just one second, what, what that sort of means. Because even nobility, and those of you who have, uh, have discussed Dante with me, in the past know that this notion of nobility is quite cloudy and it's it's not quite as cut and dried as we often think that um, that think that it should be maybe uh, or think that it is but regardless the Ghibellines typically were a party that tended towards a an idea that the emperor was to have temporal power right and he was to be the uh, ultimate kind of decision maker when it came to worldly affairs, right? We're going to see that this is a little bit different with the Guelph party. Um, so typically the Ghibellines tend towards uh, the more imperial sphere. Um, you see these years of 1240s. So in those years, in those decades, we have the emperor, the, the Hohenstaufen emperor, Frederick II and Frederick II, was uh, incredibly important. He had moved the capital of the, uh, the Holy Roman Empire to Palermo. He actually uh, lived in Palermo and, and had a, a, an amazing court, all in, in really Southern Italy in the early part of the 13th century, um, benefited so much from this amazing culture of Frederick II and everyone that he sort of called in. So um, this is a party that, again, we're in the sort of mid 1200s right here, what we're talking about. So they tend to align themselves with Frederick II and with the imperial uh, sphere. I put up Farinata degli Umberti because it's essentially impossible to have any kind of conversation about Ghibellines, especially in Florence without talking about Farinata degli Umberti. Um, is quite possibly the greatest of all of the Ghibellines. This is uh, an early 15th century fresco, part of an illustrious men fresco cycle. And even though, of course, Farinata de Uberti was a Ghibelline, ultimately defeated, uh, uh, he was regarded as someone who always had the highest interest of Florence at heart. Um, Farinata degli Uberti, his family's property was actually where Palazzo Vecchio is today, where Palazzo della Repubblica or Palazzo della Signoria uh, was constructed in the 1290s. We're going to see why that was in just a second. Um, his family ends up course, being exiled. Um, but Farinata de Uberti, in a, following a battle in the year 1260, saves Florence from being razed to the ground. All of the, the uh, other uh, Ghibellines had wanted Florence to be completely razed, burned to the ground, and he kind of lone, you know, statesman stands up and says, absolutely not, we will not do that to, to Firenze, to Fiorenza. Uh, and so kind of this savior, in a certain sense, of Florence, but he is absolutely the number one Ghibelline uh, in Florence, especially in the middle part of that century. So I wanted to make sure that uh, that that we talk about him. Also, those of you who uh, know and love your Dante and your Divine Comedy know that he shows up um, in Inferno 10 um, in, a, in a very wonderful uh, exchange with Dante. At any rate, um, the Guelphs. So if we say the Ghibellines are imperial, the Guelphs usually we say, oh, they're the party of the Pope or the papal sphere of influence. What does that mean? I really hesitate um, to kind of think about the Guelphs as though they were, you know, these kind of more devout or more pious or what have you. It is true that Ghibellines oftentimes were accused of heresy at a much greater rate than the Guelphs, but it's probably because um, of their Guelph enemies kind of <laughs> ensuring that that was going to happen. The Guelphs are not more religious. They're not more Christian. They're not more devout than the Ghibellines. 
let's be honest, they are bankers to the popes. When, when we say that they align themselves more with the papal sphere of influence, it has very little to do with, you know, uh, the, their true thoughts about Christianity or, or God's place and this, this whole thing. More than anything, they want to keep the Pope close because they understand that the papal bank account is the number one bank account on the entire continent of Europe. So, um, you know, my, my cynicism has crept in very, very early here, as you can see. Um, but this is typically how we tend to talk about Guelphs and Ghibellines. Now, um, the, uh, the battles between them, the struggles between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, again, why? Why uh, did some families align themselves with the Ghibellines and some with the Guelphs? You might say, well, maybe the nobles, the ones who actually did have the knightly titles, maybe they align themselves more with the Ghibellines. But we actually find in both parties, we find uh, some of the older kind of patrician families. We also find merchants in both sets of parties. So it's really impossible for us to say kind of, you know, uh, if you were this, then you were a Ghibelline, and if you were that, you were a Guelph. It is truly a power struggle in a city that is living it, 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 its biggest um, economic explosion, its, its boom during this time. Okay, we cannot forget 1252, the florin is coined. Florence is on its way to becoming the most important economy or one of the most important economies in all of Europe. And everyone wants a piece of it and everyone wants to be at the head of the action, right? So essentially between the, I'm not gonna take you through all of the different governments, but I'm just going to tell you that between, I'm gonna talk about a couple of the battles between these decades of the kind of 1240s through the 1260s, you have kind of Guelph governments and then Ghibelline governments in Florence. There are a couple of big battles that I wanna to talk to you about too, because uh, not just because of the, the governance here and the politics of it all, but also because if you come to Florence or you go, for example, to Siena, they will talk to you about the Battle of Montaperti, which happened in 1260, like it happened yesterday, okay? They are still to this day so terribly proud of the fact that they outnumbered the Sienese Ghibellines um, against the Florentine Guelphs three to one, and yet they managed to win. Why did they manage to win according to the Sienese? I'm not looking at the chat, but I would love to, love to know if any of you know why the Sienese, what the Sienese attribute their victory to. Those of you who know Sienese history and know your Sienese art history know that it's the Virgin Mary. The Virgin Mary was the one that um, guided the Sienese troops, according to them, into their victory. And so this is why she becomes queen of Siena. She's not content to be the patron saint of Siena. She's the queen of Siena. And it all has to do with the Battle of Montaperti. So dedicated to the, the uh, Queen of Heaven, to the Virgin Mary in 1260. Um, this is the moment that Farinata de Uberti, once the, the battle is over, this is the moment that at the, 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 the aftermath and at the peace, peace table, Farinata actually says uh, uh, that Florence course should be saved. Um, if we look at these years here, the year 1260, when the Ghibellines come back into power and come into power in Florence, Dante is born in 1265. So he's actually born under Ghibelline rule. What does that tell us? I mean, um, Dante will be a Guelph, as we'll see, and he'll in fact be, be a white Guelph, but his family is Guelph. What does it mean that Dante was here? And he tells us very explicitly that he was born and raised. He tells us this in the Divine Comedy in Inferno. I was born and raised in Fiorenza, in Florence. Okay, so there is no doubt. We don't you think, you know, he's born in some uh, contado place outside of, the, outside of the city. He's born and raised in the city of Florence. What does this mean? It means quite simply that Dante's family was not an important enough family, not an important enough wealth family to have been exiled, which we're going to talk about what that means in just one second, 
by the Ghibellines. So that's an important little nugget just to kind of put in the back of your mind, right? It's not that every time a Guelph government or a Ghibelline government comes in, they do a totally clean sweep. They do absolutely do a clean sweep of the highest exponents of each of these um, each of these parties. Um, it's fairly short-lived, this Ghibelline victory. In 1266, Manfred, Manfredi, who is Fred Frederick II's son, dies. Um, and at that stage, this really is kind of the, 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 um, the last uh, real hurrah for the Ghibellines in Florence. And so the Guelphs are 1267, 1268, come back in, and they do something that is, you know, uh, thank you so much, hallelujah for doing this. They kept a record. They actually, there is a document, there was a register that Dino Compagni and Giovanni Villani had access to where they were able to actually look and see when the Guelphs come back in, they do two things. Number one, they make a register of all the Guelph families with names, and so you can count them up, the Guelph families that are owed damages because of the, the um, confiscation of property on the part of the Ghibellines. And then they go in and they exile a number of families and individuals that belong to the Ghibelline families. Now look at this, the third point up here, the same number of families, so 62 families, according to this register are owed by the, the government that are owed by the Ghibellines, let's say to the Guelphs. And there are 62 families that are Ghibellines that are exiled. So what does that tell us? It tells us that, that basically the Guelphs and the Ghibellines were pretty equal numbers here in Florence during the 13th century. Some of the le lesser Ghibelline families will actually stay in Florence. And I put up these names because they're probably familiar to you. So this is just a, a few names. So the Strozzi, the Pulci of Luigi Pulci, the, the poet, uh, the Portinari of Beatrice fame, um, and then the Macci family, those of you familiar with Via dei Macci here in the Sant'Ambrogio area. Um, so I just thought that was uh, kind of fun to, to, to look at those. Um, what, is, what does that tell us? Like I said, the lesser, the, 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 you know, the lesser important families actually can stay uh, in Florence and they'll eventually uh, become Guelphs, right? So the Strozzi, for example, will become a Guelph family. I keep mentioning exile. What is exile all about? Look at this amazing uh, manuscript. This is the Yate Thompson from um, now held at the British Library. This is a manuscript of the Divine Comedy. Look at Dante being pushed out. Can you see this? the gate of Florence, uh, the Giglio up above. Do you see the Giglio up above the gate of Florence? And then back behind it, the author, excuse me, the illustrator couldn't quite help himself. He puts an unfinished cupola in the back of, uh, of, of this scene. Of course, in uh, 1301, there was no such thing as a cupola anywhere near uh, the very brand new construction that will become eventually the Duomo on Santa Maria del Fiore. At any rate, uh, Dante being exiled. What was exile? Exile, first of all, is extraordinarily common. Okay, when we look at politics in the in this period in the 13th and 14th century, it's actually or governing. I guess I should say government and politics. Maybe not the politics as much, but the governing. There, there are a lot of similarities. There aren't a lot of differences actually between. You know, there's councils and there's committees and there's meetings and there's things that are being voted on and decided and kind of the rhythm is probably pretty familiar to us. What isn't familiar to us is that, or familiar to them, is that we in our modern democracies, we work with, or the idea being the opposition party, so those who lost the elections, are still part of the government, right? This is unthinkable. It was unthinkable that the Guelphs, for example, when they take over in 1267, 1268, that they would have kept the important Ghibelline, highest powers of the Ghibellines around in Florence. It would have been absolute murder and, and, and a total nightmare. So exile was a very common political expedient. And it just essentially is exactly what you think it is. It is the banishment of 
the uh, male members of the family, oftentimes if the exile lasted uh, for a number of decades the, the, uh, or a number of years, the, the female members of the family would follow. Um, but it also it, it means that when you're exiled, your property is confiscated. So one of the biggest, um, and I think the most dramatic um, uh, you know, kind of um, what follows exile here in Florence is that your tower house would actually be scaposizzato, so meaning that the head would be taken off. The tower houses, of course, here in Florence are symbols of the family's importance and their wealth. And so it is the chopping down, it is the visual reminder that this family no longer holds that level, that, that, uh, that, that sort of place in the city, that high place in the city. So exile was extraordinarily common and it was mainly for that reason, which was to say that you have been beaten, you have been beaten probably in a very bloody battle and you are no longer welcome to take part in the city's governing at all. Um, and again, like I said, we're talking about the most important members or the ones that would have been most threatening, let's say. 1289, I'll tell you about another battle. 1289, Campaldino. So this is another one that has a lot to do with Dante. He fought in the Battle of Campaldino. Uh, this is an image of the castle at Poppi, um, but Campaldino is the, the near Arezzo. It's a plain near Arezzo. And this is the ultimate victory of the Guelph. So remember 1266, we already have essentially the Ghibellines don't come back to rule at all after 1266. But after 1289, we really think about Campaldino as the absolute definitive end of Ghibelline rule in Florence. So uh, from that time, you don't, uh, you don't have uh, Ghibellines uh, really even around Tuscany, they're, they're going to start to really fall uh, in importance. And like I said, the Ghibelline families that were kind of on the edge, uh, on the edges in the Ghibelline party would eventually be incorporated into the Guelph. So I mentioned this word elite, right? And I just wanted to give us a kind of vocabulary here because as you, if you go a little bit deeper into the study of some of this, you'll start to see these words. So the elite versus the popolo. So the elite, again, we don't want to use the word noble because many of these families didn't actually have noble titles. Some of them did. They had knights in their families. Dante tells us in Paradiso that his great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather that he was speaking to was knighted uh, by the Emperor Conrad. And so um, it was very important to be able to say something like that, but not all of them did. So when we talk about the elite, we're talking about these powerful, wealthy families that could have been right landowners that would, would have been nobility, um, international bankers, traders, right? This new class of uh, people, uh, this new class of merchants, really, the, the, the uh, bourgeoisie that is starting to uh, really take hold during this, during this time. Who is the popolo? The popolo are the non-noble working classes or the non, the ones who don't have guild access, for example. Then we start to break it down between the popolo grasso, so the fat popolo, the, the big popolo grasso, and then the popolo minuto, so the small, right? So you have the, the um, popolo grasso that really starts to grow, that start to take on, right, more and more as we're going to see uh, part of the government professionals, guild members, and then the non-guild members, those who were barred actually from having any kind of guild representation, the Popolo Minuto. The Popolo Minuto, I'm not gonna get into this at all tonight because it's just outside of our time frame, but they're gonna come into play in the 14th century. So that, that would be the next chapter in our discussion tonight. Just a note on what guilds are. So in Florence, first of all, they're called Le Arti. So oftentimes you'll hear the arte della lana, for example, and you sort of think, what does that mean? Wool art? Arte meaning a, a, a kind of trade or business, right? So arte uh, in, in uh, Italian and uh, certainly in the Tuscan dialect of the time, it would have been a guild, what we would call a kind of trade guild. In Florence, the seven major guilds, so this is, Florence is a textile city, it's a luxury textile 
uh, uh, Mecca. This is where the highest quality wool is being dyed and finished and then sent out. They're providing between seven and 10% of all the luxury textiles to the European market are coming from Florence, thanks to our river, right? Our river is not navigable but it is great for, for um, powering those machines and for getting waste out of the city itself. So it's a huge, huge luxury textile hub. So you have the Kalimala Guild, the commercial, the kind of merchants guild. You have the Arte de la Lana, wool guild. You have the bankers guild. You have the doctors and apothecaries, the judges and notaries, on and on and on, right? Then you're going to have another tier of intermediate guilds and then of lesser guilds. And these start, to be organized already in the 12th century. So the time that we're talking about tonight, mid 13th up uh, through the very early 14th century, they are really consolidating and they are really coming into their own. And so the, the image that I have on the left-hand side are some of the symbols of the major guilds and then um, in intermediate, and then um, the Church of Orsan Michele, which of course is our guild church here in Florence. Um, the guilds become so important that in 1282, we have what's called the Priorato, the Priory of the Arti, of the guilds. Okay, so a guild republic. And I've just put up here some, again, vocabulary that you might come across. So things like gonfaloniere di giustizia. So this would have been a figure that presided over the Council of Priors. The Priors were the ones we'll talk about in a second who exercised the executive power. The Consiglio dei Cento, so the Council of 100 who exercised financial uh, and economic control. So they were signing the checks. The Podesta, the Palazzo del Podesta, what we now call the Bargello, um, started in 1255, our very first civic building here in Florence, was uh, a foreign magistrate. So it was a six month posting that would have uh, been held by a very wealthy noble or member of the elite from another city. So outside of the Republic of Florence city-state. Um, and then the signoria, this tends to confuse people like they think signorina, signoria, is uh, the actual name of the government um, that really kind of can, when we're talking about the signoria, it's the gonfaloniere di giustizia and the priors. Now the priors are the ones that usually get the most play in a conversation like this. Dante himself was a prior. We'll talk about that in just one second. Um, but the priors during the time period that we're talking about um, would have been between, they were in Dante's time, they were six members. They're going to go up to eight. At a certain point, they become 25, but that's outside of our time frame. Um, and they hold two month terms. So they are a rotating body. Okay, so six times a year, you've got new priors of the city. And it was a very prestigious posting. And it was something that only guild members could actually, it was an office that only the guild members of the, of the, the major guilds could actually hold. So it was incredibly prestigious. They dressed in all red. So they dressed in this uh, flor very Florentine costume called the Luco. So I wrote that down for you. And they were also sequestered, meaning that in that two month time period, they would be together, right? They would stay. We don't have Palazzo Vecchio or Palazzo della Signoria quite yet, but they would stay in places like the Torre della Castagna. Uh, they would meet in at churches. And this was very common all over Tuscany. So it's not just Florence. You start to see these um, communal buildings, these civic buildings start to be built during that time period. So we have these priors that play an absolutely essential role in the uh, governing actually of the city. Um, something incredibly important happens in 1293, and they're called the Ordinamenti di Giustizia. And the head of this, the, the, the kind of name behind this big um, uh, um, new rule, this new law, this new reordering here of how the government was going to work is called Gianno, Gianno della Bella. Okay, the Della Bella family was a very important family um, in Florence. And in fact, there is a Dante plaque um, just on Via dei Cerchi, uh, right by the, the Tripaio. Those of you who are familiar with the Lampredotaio Tripaio stand right there. Um, now there's a grocery store there. It used to be the American Express office way back in the day. But there's a plaque there, um, one of the Dante plaques that talks about uh, Gianna della Bella. Why, is, why do I mention this? 
this is an absolutely watershed moment because in 1293, now John de la Bella is actually from a noble family. So not just from the elite, he's actually from a noble family. Um, so in a certain sense, he's kind of going against his own family's interests, but he makes a lot of really great friends with the, this new merchant class. And so you have John de la Bella and the Ordinamenti di Giustizia, which essentially say only guild members can be eligible, are eligible for governing the city. So eligible to be a prior, okay? He also, at that same time, emits a list of what we call the magnati or the grandi, okay? Of families, a list of, of last names, of cognomi, that uh, are completely banned from participating in politics. So, and, and in governing. Right? I guess not, not banned from politics, but certainly from governing, which was the more important thing. And so a huge portion of, these, of this elite is completely cut out of the situation. There's ways to get around it, right? There's, some of them are going to change their last names and say, well, I'm not really part of that family. The famous example are the Tornabuonis, who uh, were formerly known as the Tornaquinches, but they sort of say, no, 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 we're not from that branch of the family. We're from another branch of the family. We're from the Tornabuoni side, Buoni, right, the good side. Um, and they change their name, and so they're allowed to participate. The rules are going to be softened a bit. The names aren't going to matter so much as the fact that you had to be a participant in a guild. What does this mean? It means that this is the end of, if you can say, that kind of feudal system or that, that feudal rule that just on the basis of a title, you really have no more say, you have no more role in the life of the, the Republic of Florence. And so this is a, a, an incredibly important moment. Um, and as I said, the rules will be relaxed, but you, you have to imagine the tensions that are, that are really growing here between this new class of people Again, some of them are nobles that also started banks. So they're former Guelphs, for example, or even former Ghibelline families. Maybe they got a knighthood along the way, but at the same time, they started a textile company. They started a, a, a merchant bank, these sorts of things. So it really has so much to do with the money. And this is something that Dante, of course, um, is going to harp on in the comedy. So this new plutocracy, um, Pluto, who is the god of the underworld, but often associated right, with, with wealth, um, this notion of kind of gold and, and, and ore coming from inside of the earth. Um, those older elite families, like I said, are going to completely disappear if they don't have the commercial connection. So the, many of those families are going to completely disappear. And then we're going to have this mix, like I've talked about, of nobles and then these very high wealth merchant families that are also starting to come into their own. As I mentioned, Florence is on its way to becoming, and the, the gold florin, the Fiorino d'Oro is on its way to becoming the standard European uh, uh, currency all over Europe and the Mediterranean. And so um, here again, it's the wealth, it's the wanting the piece of the, the pie and the power and all of that. But it also is this kind of social tension of this new wealthy class and this new class that kind of, um, it's kind of like, I mean, it's happening all over sort of central Italy at this point. But this new merchant class that can't trace its lineage back more than two or three generations. And so in a way, they're kind of like, you know, the, to the nobles, we don't really want anything. We don't get your traditions, but they're also a little bit envious. They're a little bit jealous of their traditions. So they like this notion of, for example, marrying their sons off to noble women so that they're given, you know, kind of some of that nobility rubs off on them, but it's a very interesting moment if you think about sort of society and how um, these new classes are interacting with the old. And this again is something, it's a major, major theme in Dante's uh, comedy. And here I put this illustration of uh, Dore here of Dante and Beatrice speaking with his uh, relative uh, 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 Cacciaguida. 
Um, so getting into uh, you know, the Guelph Ghibellines uh, fall apart, the Cerchi then and the Donati, this is where the whites and the blacks are going to be born. So this moment, if you say, great, the Ghibellines are gone, the Guelphs can just really get down to business. Of course, that's not going to happen. As I mentioned, everyone wants a piece of the pie. Everyone wants to be a part of this and to be able to say that they are, you know, at the sort of highest levels of power in this booming Republic of Florence. Uh, and so you have these two families and I put their coats of arms up here, the Donati on the right-hand side and the Cerchi, they have what we call a stemma parlante, a speaking uh, emblem. So these circles, you'll know, uh, those of you who speak Italian, that Cerchio is circle. So the Cerchi family. So the Donati and the Cerchi, who are these people? I've put up an image here. This is where I typically start our Guelph Ghibelline walk at the Arco of San Pierino um, at the Torre dei Donati. So the Donati are the head of the Black family. I've just put up a very brief little for what we know. Uh, they're the very first named uh, member of the family is called Fiorenzo. And Fiorenzo already in 1065 is credited with founding um, a hospital, a spedale. So a kind of um, spedale did all sorts of things. It wasn't just for the sick, although that was part of it. Um, called San Paolo di Pinti. So near, uh, near here, actually near uh, the, the Torre dei Donati. Uh, near Borgo Pinti and the Porta a Pinti, the Pinti Gate. Um, so they have been longtime Guelphs. Um, why do the Donati start to fight with the Cerchi? Um, the Cerchi, <laughs> unlike the Donati, the, the Cerchi were a little more successful financially. And towards the middle part of the 1200s, the Cerchi start to do something which was absolutely late, 1200s, absolutely not done prior to this. Typically, when you have, and this is going to go on actually for a couple of generations, typically a family kind of stays in one place, right? They, uh, they settle there and then they start to buy or uh, conquer their neighbors. And so they start to amass property in one particular neighborhood, right? Um, the Cherokee decide that they're actually going to start buying up property all over the city. And this is where you're going to get into some problems, not only because the Donati think the Cerchi are showing off, so they're part of this new money uh, contingent, right? Again, these tensions that we talked about, they're part of this. But more than anything, it's that we don't do it. Non si fa. You don't do that. You don't come into someone else's quote unquote neighborhood and start uh, putting your stamp on it. The Cherokee move into a former property, that property that formerly belonged to the Conti Guidi family that had been defeated. And so uh, this is, of course, next door to the Donati. You know that your worst enemy is always your neighbor. You don't care what the guy across town is doing, but your neighbor, yes, right? So the Cherokee move into the Donati neighborhood. Uh, the Donati are più antichi di sangue, you can see here. This is from. Uh, uh, Villani, Giovanni Villani, più antichi di sangue, meaning that they have an older bloodline, but they really both, I mean, more or less, the Cherki aren't, you know, they hadn't shown up the generation before, let's say, it's that they were very financially successful. So um, Dante's wife, Gemma, is actually part of uh, the Donati family. Corso Donati, he's nicknamed Il Barone, he's the main person that will be talking about. He um, is the one that shows up all over the Divine Comedy, for example. He's the head of the Donati in this main moment of the breakdown of the whites and the blacks. He's pretty terrible. You can read all about him in, uh, in Dante's comedy. This is a, uh, uh, an image from a much later time period um, that illustrates the story of Corso Donati's sister, Picarda, who he had um, forcibly removed from a Franciscan convent and forced her into marrying one of his henchmen. And so um, she is in Paradiso and she recounts this to Dante. He's, uh, Corso Donati is, um, 
he is, you know, sort of arrogant and strong and wealthy and really uh, commands uh, quite a bit of respect through force, okay? The Cherokee family are kind of going to be known as pacifists. Now, they're going to be at the head of the whites. So as I mentioned, this is the family that starts to move into the Donati neighborhood. Um, they're from a, a land-owning family out near Ponta Sieva in the eastern part of the province of Florence. Um, they, as I mentioned, had become very successful merchants, and so they had amassed quite a bit of wealth. Uh, and as I already mentioned, they move into the, the property that used to belong to the Contiguidi. Dante aligns himself with the whites. Okay, the blacks, the, the Donati, and the Cerchi are the head of the whites. I mentioned that they're neighbors. And again, if we were all together, actually right now since COVID it's been closed, but um, when this whole COVID mess is finished, we will uh, we will take a walk together and I will take you into the Vicolo de lo Scandalo, which is, it's not beautiful. I'm telling you, it's probably the grittiest place in all of Florence, but it's so, so cool. I, um, I always bring people back here when the door is open. This door that you see on the right-hand side is, um, is on uh, Borgo Albizzi or Via del Corso at that point, it's uh, Via del Corso. And it actually takes you through, it's, a, it's, it's, it's open. Uh, it takes you all the way through, you are walking back through all of these medieval uh, houses. Um, and it takes you out so that you exit out on Via Dante Alighieri. So those of you who are familiar, it's just one block away, but it's called the Vicolo de lo Scandalo because in the early 1300s, the, the tensions had got, or excuse me, the late 1200s had gotten so intense between the whites and the blacks, the Donateschi and the Cherkeschi, that they um, insisted, the government actually insisted on a space in between their two properties so that it, it was kind of like a, um, a DMZ, right, where you could um, walk through without um, you know, worrying about uh, being fired upon uh, in, uh, in in, in 13th century ways. And so um, it's still one of these remnants of this really intense period in Florentine history where um, the blacks and the whites, the Cerchi and the Donati were, uh, were really going at each other's throats constantly. I put this quote up here in Italian, it's from Dino Compagni, but it's why do we call them blacks and whites? Um, it's a very funny story um, and has nothing to do with Florence. This is Pistoia, as you can see here uh, on the, in the image on the slide. Um, the blacks and the whites come from a family called the Cancellieri family in Pistoia. And this particular family, the head of the family, this man had been married twice and he had two sets of children. And there was a litigio, there was a fight between the children from the first marriage, who they were older, so their hair was white, so they were called the Bianchi, and then the Neri, who were the family from the second marriage. Okay, so again, something that has nothing to do with Florence, but those Bianchi had friends and family and connections to the Cerchi here in Florence and the, the Neri to the Donati family. So this is actually where uh, those uh, names come from. So again, a, not a Florentine, uh, the, the Florentines take it over. They, they you know, kind of take the names and then uh, turn them completely crazy. So what is the difference between the blacks and the whites? Um, I really got into this versus thing. Uh, so the Pope versus Emperor, you know, smack down here. Um, the Blacks tended, so the Neri tended towards this notion of miso domenici, meaning that the Pope has been sent, has been mandato, right, um, from God, right, by God to rule as an absolute ruler. So, so the vicar of Christ on earth, he's a temporal ruler, he's a spiritual ruler. As I mentioned, um, they typically tend to align themselves with the Pope because the money is so good. Um, and then the whites uh, who thought absolutely the Pope should be defended. So these aren't Ghibellines, right? The Pope should be defended but that the emperor should be the one making these kind of temporal decisions and that the Pope and the emperor should work together. Okay. Um, and so again, distilling it, but, but maybe taking it out to a more, um, 
a more kind of global level and a more economic level, you see that the Blacks are going to really forcefully align themselves uh, with the Pope and the Pope at the time in Boniface. Dante is a white Guelph. Dante is a white Guelph. And I just put this, oh, so I, I fibbed to you. I said that there was just one, sorry. Um, there's another one. Purgatory 16 this time, not Paradiso 16. This is Purgatory 16, where he talks about the due soli, the two sons. So Rome, uh, which made the good world, used to have two sons that made visible the two paths of the world, temporal and God, okay? Spiritual. Dante, in a, in a later uh, treatise uh, on... Um, on the monarchy, on, um, on, on, on governing essentially and on the empire, talks about this theory of the due soli, the two sons. So me, what is Dante saying? He's saying that, and this is what the white uh, uh, Guelphs would have, uh, would have espoused, is this notion that there are two sons. Okay, so each, um, each uh, entity, emperor and pope have their own light. They are both imbued with that light by God, but that the emperor has his role and the pope has his, okay? The Guelphs instead, the black Guelphs, excuse me, are going to believe rather in a uh, much more church friendly, right? What the pope espouses, which is that the church is the sun and the emperor and the empire is the moon. What does that mean? Of course, how does the moon get its light? It derives its light from the sun. So the emperor gets his power from the sun, meaning from God and from the church in particular. So the white wealth and Dante will uh, much more, you know, kind of align themselves, as I mentioned, with this notion of the two sons. Dante will actually get in big trouble for that later on, but that's a story for another time. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the big three. So what are the big three issues here between the blacks and the whites after the Cerchi had moved into the Donati family neighborhood? Um, number one, Corso Donati, so our big arrogant head of the blacks, um, denies inheritance to his second wife. He had remarried someone called Tessa Ubertini and she was a uh, member she was a, a um, she was a relative of the Cherkis. Okay, so the Cherkis were related to her. This was very common. This is why Dante married someone from the Donati family who are Black Guelphs. It was very, very common. And it wasn't always like absolutes, you know, oh, just because you're a Guelph or just because you're a, a Black or just because you're a White. So oftentimes there are these kind of um, very murky areas. He denies uh, an inheritance to uh, this relative of the Cherki, so that's a big giant strike. Number two um, was there was a, a group of the Cherki and the Donati, kind of the young men of the time who had gotten into some pretty serious uh, fights out on the streets of Florence and neither side wanted to admit that they were the ones that should pay for the damage. And so they were all hauled into the Bargello or the Palazzo del Podesta as it was called to be tried, to, to be tried at the, the, the Podesta was the justice, hall of justice. And um, six members of the Cherki family died while they were there awaiting this, uh, awaiting this trial because they had been fed poisoned cakes by the Donati family. So this is another one. Um, and then the, the, the third big uh, incident that takes place between the Blacks and Whites is that um, there was a funeral uh, happening in Piazza Frescobaldi for um, Piazza dei Frescobaldi for a uh, for a woman, and everyone was sitting on the ground except for the knights. Of course, they were not on the ground, but they were sitting on the ground. And one of the members of one of the sides, who knows, the blacks or the whites, stood up to adjust his robes. The story goes. And because he was sitting down and he you know, was sort of making a motion with his robes, the other side went for their weapons when, when the robe adjusting side, because we don't know who started it, saw that the other side went for their weapons, they went for their weapons too, and this huge clash ensued. Okay, so these are kind of the big three incidents that happen um, uh, between, uh, between them. We've already talked a little bit about who the, the Neri were and who the Bianchi were. 
enter Pope Boniface VIII. So if we just think about, and I'm always motioning here to my window, I'm sitting in my living room and just outside my window is the center of Florence. So I'm always, you know, out on the streets and out in the center of Florence. Um, you have the blacks with Corso Donati, you have the Cerchi family at the head of the whites. Now enter Pope Boniface VIII. Pope Boniface VIII is, uh, is the, the head of the church at this time. He is uh, an incredible, uh, it passes these kind of incredible uh, laws that have to do with his temporal power. So he is uh, very, very close to the blacks. So the, um, the Neri, right? The uh, uh, wealthy Neri. Um, right at this time, in right at the beginning of the year 1300, the beginning of the year, beginning of spring. So I guess in Florence, it is the beginning of the year. May 1st is a, was a festival called Calendi Maggio. And you, what we're gonna start to see is that in the spring and in the early summer of that year, you have these incredible, um, uh, kind of riots that actually start to take place between the blacks and the whites. And so um, this is the moment, and often this is referred to when you're uh, learning about Dante, is that he, when he was a prior, it's not actually true, it's not when he was a prior, it's when he was part of the Council of the 100 that we've talked about. He both, and Dino Compagni, the, the um, chronicler, were both part of this uh, council that um, exiled the extreme sides of both the leadership sides of both the blacks and the whites. And this is going to be uh, a moment that is going to put into motion a series of events that will eventually lead to Dante's, uh, to Dante's exile. The Donati of course refused to leave. Uh, Florence, the Cerchi actually leave, they go the Cerchi in there, the whites I should say, um, and go up to Sarzana and they're exiled there. Boniface VIII, Corso runs down to him, to Pope Boniface VIII, and Pope Boniface VIII calls Vieri de Cerchi, who's the head of the whites, to come down as well to Rome. He says, you know, I've heard that you are meeting up with some of the Ghibellines. What's happening there? Are you a Ghibelline? Cer uh, Vieri de Cerchi says, I'm not a Ghibelline. I swear that I'm a Guelph. He, you know, sort of swears to the Pope. He says, but I can't work with him. I can't, I, I cannot make peace with, with Corso Donati. So we're at an impasse here where you have the Pope who starts to get involved. And the Pope actually sends someone into Florence. He's called Charles of Valois. He's the brother of the French king. And um, this is the autumn of the year 1300. So it's kind of like this drumbeat where you start to have all of these, uh, you have these riots, you have these issues, you have people who are being sent down to Rome, you have people who are coming back from Rome, you have the Pope who has now gotten involved. Charles of Valois comes in in November of 1301, swearing, of course, I will not do anything to injure any part of the city or its inhabitants, no matter what the party is. I am a neutral party being sent in to broker a peace by Pope Boniface VIII. What we know now, of course, is that Corso Donati, Charles of Valois, and Pope Boniface VIII had all come together and they had created an alliance amongst themselves uh, that uh, would eventually end in uh, the ultimate control of the Guelfi Neri in Florence and the exile of, uh, of, of Dante. Dante and Petrarch's father, Petrarco, are actually exiled at the same time in early 1302. Okay, it's in the Florentine calendar, it's still considered 1301, um, but it's early 1302. He bands together with other exiles, Dante, um, and really until 1304, he's holding out hope, kind of crossing his fingers that a peace is going to be brokered between the blacks and the whites. Um, there was a little bit of hope in 1304. There actually was a peace and the peace kiss actually took place. I don't know if you know, but um, whenever two entities wanted to make peace, it's kind of like a wedding ceremony. You may now kiss the bride, it seals the deal. Well, uh, this also in um, peace treaties. So you would have the two major white and black exponents that would actually kiss. It was a kiss on the mouth in Santa Maria Novella. that was all recorded and it's all in, in all the chronicles. It of course was completely, you know, it lasted about point, point 0.1 seconds. Uh, and Corso Donati essentially takes control 
uh, and the black Guelphs take control of, uh, of the city. And so um, he becomes so arrogant, he becomes so used to being uh, the most powerful man that he decides that he's going to attempt a sort of coup to become the ultimate ruler of Florence. This is 1308. He is stopped and um, he is killed in a very bloody way. You can see here one is a, a, a medieval manuscript and the other is a, a 19th century painting of the death of Corso Donati. It ends very, very badly, very, very bloodily for him. But the death of Corso Donati um, will uh, mark the end of this kind of struggle between the blacks and the whites. You're going to get into a whole different um, a whole different society, a whole different uh, um, political game after the early 14th century. And I'll just end here, as I promised, we started and we end with Dante. He called himself exul imeritus, so a, uh, a, an exile without merit, right? He will always say he was tried in absentia and he was not guilty, but at a certain point he has in his convivio, which is a treatise on philosophy, he has a song, a canzone, that's called Tre Donne Intorno al Cor Mi Son Venute. And in this poem, he actually says, it's sort of chiede perdono, he asks for pardon by the Blacks. Says, you won fair and square, could you please pardon me? There's nothing, non c'è cosa più bella, there's nothing more beautiful than offering that, than a, for a victor to offer a pardon. Of course, it goes completely without response. So I will wrap it up there. I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to look at the chat and then I'm happy to take questions, comments, anything. Oh, thank you.